too much money. That's the cause of our inflation, why prices are rising so fast. A glut of tomatoes, what happens is that their price falls. A glut of strawberries and their price falls. So doesn't the same apply to these? Isn't the reason why the pound in your pocket's losing its value simply because there are far too many of them about? That's what I'm going to look at in this programme, the view that inflation's caused not by trade unions or oil sheiks, but by too much money floating around the economy. It's a claim held by a number of economists and politicians, including Sir Keith Joseph and Enoch Powell. And because of it, they're often known as monetarists. To see what they're getting at, think first about what's happened and why in the housing market. Half the homes in Britain are privately owned. A lot more people would like to own their own homes but can't afford to. And in the past few years, things have got more difficult than ever. Between 1970 and 1973, house prices more than doubled, often leading to situations of near panic. For days, people have been queuing by the building site. Some had slept in cars. One even hired a caravan and moved next door to the sales office 11 days ago. This was the only way Mrs. Jane Payne could make certain of getting her new dream house in the first-come, first-served sale. A caravan vigil for Mr. and Mrs. Payne got them their house. They were first to sign up and pay their £50 deposit. When they'd started queuing 11 days ago, they were told their house would cost £7,500. But when they signed for it, the final price was more than £1,000 more. But with inflation on this scale, for many, the prospect of ever owning their own home forever retreats into the distance. But what caused house prices to explode? Well, nearly everyone who wants to buy a house needs a mortgage or a loan. In 1970, before the boom, the average price of a house was just under £5,000. Building societies and banks lent about 2,300 million to people to buy houses. What happened over the next three years is even now pretty breathtaking. House prices doubled to £10,000 for the average house in 1973. At the same time, and this is the important point, the amount of money made available to pay for them also doubled. So that's it, say those who blame money for our inflation. Between 1970 and 1973, you had the same number or even slightly fewer houses for sale each year, and then suddenly you provided more money for people to spend on them. Only one thing could happen. Prices had to rise. On this argument, it's the building societies and banks who are to blame for the astronomical rise in house prices between 1970 and 1973 by making it easier for people to borrow. The house hunters who were falling over each other in their efforts to catch whatever was available were just ill-fated pawns caught up in something they couldn't control. Further evidence that house prices are very largely determined by the availability of mortgages came in 1974. House prices at last went into reverse, just as the supply of mortgages and credit dried up. According to the monetarists, those who blame money, what's true of house prices is true of other prices. If there's more money about and it's easier for people to borrow, then, so it's argued, borrow they will. I bought uh, three pieces of wheat on the, on the HP. Didn't have enough cash at the time, no. Well, I had my um, place carpeted through. It was too expensive to pay cash. Of course, didn't have enough money for the actual thing itself and wanted a radiogram. The credit boom now offers many people the opportunity to buy things that they could never previously afford. Whether it's personal accounts, higher purchase or easy terms, credit has now become not just a possibility, but a fact of life. What started as a convenience for the shopper has now become an essential service for the trader. Well, not so many people have, have the money to pay for a car outright. There's a considerable number of them do have money, where they get it from the banks or it's their personal savings. But if somebody wants credit, we've got to be in a position to offer them credit. Well, if we weren't able to offer credit facilities, naturally sales would drop to a certain extent, quite an, uh, a reasonable amount, no doubt. And as a result, the profits that we made from the credit sales might indeed, or the ones that we failed to make from the credit sales, might indeed wipe out our actual profit. 
Despite this mess of credit, it's still the banks which are the most important source. They provide not just your personal overdraft, if you're one of the lucky ones, but also loans to industry and trade, and they've been at it for a long time. They've in fact learned how to manufacture credit. But just how safe is it? It was during the English Civil War in the 17th century that banking really started in Britain. In these troubled times, people deposited their gold and silver coins with goldsmiths for safekeeping. In return, the goldsmiths gave them a receipt, and people started to use these receipts like money instead of the coins themselves. After the war, the receipts continued to be used by people as money. The goldsmiths came to realise that there was nothing to stop them lending out a few extra receipts to those who wanted to borrow and charge them interest. They just had to make sure that they had enough gold to repay anyone who wanted it. So gradually, the number of these promissory notes in circulation became greater than the amount of gold held by the goldsmiths. What's more, these handwritten receipts promising to pay became so acceptable as money that in the course of time they were printed and called banknotes. Small banks throughout the country began to print their own banknotes to lend out. But these notes were only acceptable as money for as long as people believed that the banks could give them gold in exchange for their notes. During the 1830s and 40s, a spectacular wave of bank collapses shattered people's confidence in the soundness of banking. Today, English banks are no longer allowed to print their own notes, but they continue to make their living by lending money and charging interest for it. What's more, the goldsmith's practice of lending out more notes than the gold he kept has a modern parallel. Today, banks lend out far more money than they keep in their tills. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. That's really quite interesting. I've been working here as a cashier for the last couple of hours. And in that time, I've taken £1,164 and I've paid out £1,292. What's been happening is that people have come in and made withdrawals, but other people have come in and made fresh deposits. And by and large, the two have cancelled each other out. That's meant that I haven't had to keep very much money in my till to finance quite a large volume of business. And that's the secret of banking. It's what has enabled the banks over the years to build up a pyramid of credit money on the basis of quite a small proportion of hard cash. So the banking system feeds on people's confidence that their money's safe and that if they want it, they can always withdraw it. As a result, just like the goldsmiths, the banks are able to lend out more than they hold in their tills. So once the banks are supplied with extra cash, they can increase their lending. They can build a pyramid of credit on top, and that's how they make their living. But sometimes, they meet someone who'll play them at their own game. Take the case of Peter Davies. Peter Davis is a poverty developer who made £6 million in just 20 months. He started his company in October 1971 with £2,000, at the beginning of the poverty boom. By June 1973, he owned property worth £24 million. He explained to me just how the explosive growth of his company was founded on bank lending. We'll take this property as, a, as an example, um, as we're in it. This property uh, would have cost us something over £2 million. Um, at the time of purchase, we obtained a professional valuation which indicated that the property had a value approaching £2 million. Um, a bank was then approached, um, a bank who we had reason to believe would have enough money to uh, lend to us and would wish to lend us money. Uh, this bank would advance between 70 or 80% uh, of the valuation. Um, the balance we would find ourselves in one form or another. Um, that would be the first step. The property would then have been purchased. The company would be exposed to some risk because in the event that the next step was not achieved, um, obviously the loan might be recalled and um, we might not be able to repay it. Right. So what would you do next then? The next step would then of course be to uh, improve the value of the property. In the 
shortest possible time, obviously, because of the risk of exposure at this point. Uh, the site would be improved or planning consent obtained or some other factor brought into play which might improve the uh, asset worth of the property. It'd become a lot more valuable as soon as you get the certificate. Exactly. Right. Um, you would then go back to your banker and say, we have achieved what we set out to achieve in the first place. The property, therefore, is rather more valuable and here is a professional valuation to support um, our supposition. Uh, can we please have some more money, perhaps, to develop um, build the new buildings or whatever. Or to buy other properties. Or indeed to buy other properties, yes. Yes, indeed. So if in 1971 you'd wanted to make a fortune out of property development, the key was learning how to borrow. Once you'd selected a site, a site which you felt could profitably be developed or turned into offices, then you were in business. There were just five moves to making a fortune. One. Go to an independent valuer and find out how much the property is worth now. Two, go to the bank and on the basis of this valuation, borrow money. Use the money to buy the original property. Three, draw up plans for developing the property. Go to the planning authority and ask for planning permission. With the planning permission, four, Go back to the independent valuer and ask for a revaluation of the property on the basis of this certificate. With these two pieces of paper go back to the bank again and borrow more money from them. With the money, either buy another property or develop this one. And that's how it was done. It was getting this extra money which was the key to expanding. But why were the banks so prepared to lend so much money for property development? I asked Peter Davis. Uh, we did have this situation where the Conservative government, who were anxious to launch us into Europe, effectively um, printed quite a lot of money, perhaps rather too much money, um, with hindsight, um, for purposes of getting British industry into competitive shape with Europe. Unfortunately, British industry didn't respond to this money, and rather too much money was floating about in the economy. Uh, the banks possibly taking a short-term view, hoping that sooner or later industry might respond to this superb pile of money, had to do something with it, and um, they tended to put it out on short-term loans to the property industry, uh, who traditionally have always been able, willing, and uh, in their own view properly entitled to use any money they could borrow to develop buildings um, of many categories. But you're supposed to know your business and the banks are supposed to know theirs, so why did the property market collapse at the end of 1973, beginning of 1974? Well, obviously, the um, facts began to run against a development boom in practical terms. We had uh, the beginnings of an industrial recession, which presumably the financial institutions could locate through their uh, research media. Um, we had a surplus, an obvious surplus, of property building up through Europe, which... Um, even the most indifferent observer could begin to see accumulating in quantities which would be difficult to fill in the immediate future. Uh, and, of course, we had the political factors, which um, obviously one doesn't want to dwell on too deeply, but uh, we had a situation where um, we had a socialist government who had won two elections on the backs of um, uh, developers, or the development industry, um, public opinion was drifting against the development industry. Uh, the banks, for both practical and emotional reasons, wanted their money back. And um, the beginnings of the collapse was definitely in those ingredients. So how far are you prepared to pin responsibility on the banks, first of all, for initiating the boom in the first place, and then in, um, bringing about the collapse by recalling their loans? Well, I think the recall of their loans, of course, was uh, no banker wishes to record his loan unnecessarily if it's earning good interest. Um, I suppose it was a matter of um, the banks taking the view that the money had to come back uh, because they could see that in the fullness of time the industry to which they'd been lending in these huge quantities wouldn't be able to pay the interest, let alone repay in full perhaps the loans in the fullness of time. Um, I think the banks perhaps were a little tardy in uh, sounding the alarm bells. I think they allowed the uh, industry to roll on a little bit too far before they started tightening the reins. 
Uh, and in that respect, certainly, I think they're very guilty, yes. So the banks realised that too many offices were being built. There was a glut of them, and so they knew their price must fall. And once the banks started to call back their loans, there was no way in which property companies like that of Peter Davies could repay them. They could only sell off their property for sums far below what they borrowed. So property prices soared during a period when the banks were lending out money and crashed when they called for it back. Are the banks then to blame for inflation? Is it them that's responsible for rising prices? Or is there another culprit? Once upon a time, there was a kingdom called Libertaria. It was a happy place, but the king had one problem which he couldn't solve. He was always hard up. This was because he liked his food, particularly venison, and his drink, particularly ale, and his wife used to lash out a bit on clothes. So the king decided to do what his father and his grandfather had done before him, to make some money. So he got his subjects to hand in all the gold coins in the kingdom so that he could mint a new coinage. He melted down the 25,000 pounds worth of coins which had been handed in, but he craftily added into the melting pot one lead coin for every five gold coins. So when the king gave back his subjects their new coins, he was able to return their 25,000 pounds to them, but also to keep a further 5,000 pounds, which he used to pay his bills. So the venison provider and the queen's dressmaker, and of course the armourer, got their share of the 5,000 pounds which the king held back. And the armourer, who'd refused to take any more orders from the palace, was very relieved indeed. In due course, they all spent their increased incomes in the same way as they'd always done. And the extra money began to circulate in the libertarian economy. Only now, there was 30,000 pounds worth of coins in use. The libertarians weren't producing any more, but they went on spending in just the same way. But the armourer, the venison man, and the dressmaker weren't in business for fun, but to make a profit. They soon saw that people wanted the same goods as before, but had more money to pay for them. So the armourer, the venison man, and the dressmaker put up their prices. And that's how inflation started in Libertaria. Well, according to the monetarists, what happens in Britain today is unfortunately not very different from Libertaria. British governments have been spending far more than they've been raising in taxes. During the late 1960s, this wasn't so. They even managed a small surplus in 1970. But the 1970s have seen a dramatic change. An ever-widening gap has emerged between escalating government spending and what they've recovered in tax revenue. It's estimated that in 1975-76, the gap will be a staggering 9,000 million pounds. Or put another way, it's as if every man, woman and child in this country spent £168 they haven't got. But just how can they go on spending more than they collect in taxes? Where do they get the money from? I asked Michael Parkin, Professor of Economics at Manchester. The government, of course, can spend more money than they raise in taxes in exactly the same way as you or I can spend more than we earn. That is, they can borrow. And they can borrow by selling bonds and various other kinds of securities to ordinary citizens. Second, uh, they can borrow, again, in a similar way to you and I, from foreigners. This time, however, if they borrow from foreigners, what they're borrowing are marks and dollars and other kinds of foreign currency. And they are going to then turn that into pounds in order to spend it. And when they do that, that adds to the amount of money in the economy. More directly, though, and thirdly, very unlike you and me, they can actually just print the stuff. They can turn on the printing press and print new banknotes and go out and spend them. Of course, it's a little more subtle than this, but not much. Hold it, George. The government borrows the money it needs by issuing a variety of different securities, like savings certificates and bonds. These all offer the lender a rate of interest. Most of the bonds are sold to the general public on the stock exchange, 
by the government broker. But when the government broker can't sell enough to provide all the money the government needs, he arranges for the Bank of England to supply it. Not directly, but by lending it to the banking system, so that the banks can buy the government's bonds. So the government, in effect, borrows back from the banks the money that it's printed. But how much money does the government borrow like this? The increase in government borrowing has been roughly to the tune of one third uh, financed by printing new money and another third uh, by borrowing from foreigners. So two thirds of the government's deficit has directly added to inflationary pressures. And you can see very, very clearly that uh, Britain's inflation of 1975 was caused by the monetary expansion in 1972 and 73. The inflation of the late 1960s was caused by the monetary policy of that earlier period. And this is a, almost a universal truth. It applies to all countries and all times. Whenever the money supply grows too fast, inflation follows with a, a lag of something like two years. To sum up then, what Parkin, Keith Joseph and others like him argue is that there's too much money in the economy and that's been the cause of our inflation, why prices are soaring. First and foremost, they blame the government for printing the money by spending more than they collected. And secondly, they blame the banks for lending too much. So the cure for our inflation is to slash governmental spending and impose tighter controls on how much banks and other institutions like building societies lend so that spending's kept down. But are they right? Last time we saw that many people blame increases in wages for pushing up prices, a quite different explanation. And unfortunately, in the present state of economic knowledge, we can't say for certain which is right. But one thing is certain, cutting spending will cause unemployment. And even some of those who blame excessive wage claims for inflation think that higher unemployment would be no bad thing. So next week, I'm going to look at whether a dose of unemployment would cure inflation. How much would be needed and would it be worth it? How much unemployment and for how long you need unemployment depends on how big a mess you've let yourself get into and how fast you try to get out of it. If we try now to get out of the mess we are currently in, over say five, six, even ten years, then we can perhaps do it with unemployment not reaching much more than a million but staying up there for at least the first three or four of the years that we're attempting to squeeze the inflation out. If we try to squeeze inflation out faster than that, then unemployment could easily go up to uh, a million and a half, two million. And uh, I think most people would take the view, I certainly would, that that's too big a price to pay. That is, it's not worth getting rid of inflation that fast. But we must also bear in mind that unless we are prepared to pay the price of some additional unemployment for some period of time, then the consequence is ever increasing inflation. Not even inflation stabilizing at the 20% level that we've now got, but climbing to Latin American sorts of proportions. Mm -hmm.